trying to juggle all of my papers here. Um, we're just going to go through some uh, uh, announcements real quick so that you know what's coming up here. Um, a few things we wanted, uh, wanted you to be aware of. Next Sunday, um, we are going to be serving the canteen uh, that Sunday evening. Um, I, I'm not sure where we are with people or that, so if you are interested in helping out with that, um, I don't know if there's a sign-up sheet, but at least get a hold of the office and, and let them know so that we can uh, uh, be there and be a part of that mission. Um, the week after that, on Sunday, September 7th, that's going to be our fall kickoff. Um, we're going to have a same time, 10 a.m. worship that Sunday, um, and we're going to, right after that at 11 o'clock, um, there's going to be a pork loin and potluck meal. Um, there's also going to be games and a whole bunch of other stuff and a chance for fellowship again. So um, please mark that on your calendars and, and be here and join us for that. The following Sunday, on September 14th, that's when we're going to be going back to two services. So please mark your calendars, and whether you normally uh, attend the traditional worship, which is going to be at 9 a.m., or attend the, uh, the contemporary worship, which is going to be at 11 a.m., um, just kind of make sure that uh, you mark your calendars right so that you show up at the right time for that. That's on September 14th. Um, also wanted to let you know that in your bulletin, um, there are some surveys. These are, for those of you who, who didn't get a chance during our, our breakfast potluck to fill these out, um, we collected about 31 of these. Uh, we're still interested in people's opinions and ideas, and, and it's just an, an additional chance for Pastor Dwayne to get to know the, the congregation and the church as a whole. So if you could fill these out, you can fill them out today and drop them in the offering plates, or you can take them home and fill them out and bring them in next week. Um, but just if, you know, for those of you who didn't get a chance, if you could, uh, you know, just take a few minutes and, and help us out with those, uh, that would be a big help. Um, also wanted to let you know that um, the apologetics class uh, that we had this last year is actually going to be starting up again. Um, we're, we're getting some additional details, so it, it may start as early as, as next Sunday after the service, um, but just with our, our fluctuating schedule over the next few weeks and the holiday and that, we're double checking on that. So if you are interested in that, um, you know, please keep that in mind. Uh, when you come next Sunday, we'll have some more details or we may be able to get an email out to the congregation this week with some more details, but that is going to be starting up very soon. Kevin's gonna be leading that again. And that is gonna be running um, between services once we split up through the middle of December, I believe it is. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to let you know about, um, this coming Saturday, on August 30th, LSS is going to have some volunteers come in, and they're actually going to be removing all of this rock that's around the celebration space. Um, they're going to get that out of the way to just kind of make the, the playground itself safer. It'll be easier to mow. Um, it'll protect our windows a little more, hopefully. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just to kind of clean up, clean up everything out there and... and uh, and that they, um, they're going to be doing that from 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. next Saturday. If anybody is interested, willing, able to come out and help them, um, I'm sure that they would greatly appreciate that. You can come out and, and uh, they will need, um, they'll probably need an additional wheelbarrow and, and, uh, or, or two and a couple of shovels, you know, whatever you want to wanna bring or can bring to, to help them out. And for those who... Um, can't be outside or can't be, um, you know, hauling the heavy rock or stuff like that. I believe there's also going to be a crew in here, uh, probably in the multi-purpose room, um, cleaning the, the white folding chairs, kind of scrubbing those down and, and getting those clean. Um, so if you can help out next Saturday from 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. I covered a lot. Is there anything that I may have overlooked? Oh, yes, um, if you need to get a hold of Georgianne this week, we just wanted to let you know that she has a few vacation days. Uh, it, obviously, today she's off, and, and uh, I believe on Tuesday she's also going to be out of the office. Um, if you need to reach the office, you can still call in, email. Um, you know, we'll, uh, Pastor Dwayne will respond to those as he can and, uh, and that. But just wanted to let you know in, in case you were trying to reach out to Georgianne. Um, anything else? If not... I'm going to ask you to please stand up and move about the celebration space. Greet each other this morning, please.
Father, God, we just thank you for this day. We just ask that you fill our hearts, just enrich our spirits, Lord. Help us to shout out a new hallelujah to you. Help us to praise you today. Um, just set our hearts on fire during this, uh, during this service. Um, God, it's your, in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue the service with a song called, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Please sing with us.
I'd like to invite the kids to come up now for children's time with Pastor Duane. Morning. All right. Hi, Hayes. Hey. Hi, Sam. All right. You brought your children's bulletin. All right. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Good morning. All right. How you doing? All right, you brought a pen. Yay. That's a tool. Speaking of which, I brought some tools with me. If you want to see these closer, you might want to sit down. Some houses have toolbox. This is just a box with tools in it. Do you recognize any of these tools? Uh, yeah. Yeah, what are some of them? I remember the hammer. The hammer. What do we use a hammer for? Nails. Hammering nails, right. Okay, what else do you see? Two. Yeah, a screwdriver. What do we use this for? Uh huh. To screw in screws. Right. And there's two different kinds of screwdrivers, right? You can't really use this one on something that this needs, right? So you have two tools that do the same thing, but they don't work on all the same objects. And what does this do? It wrenches things. Yeah, that's right. If you have nuts, you can wrench them. Well, um, can we use a hammer on, on things that need a wrench? No. What? You can't just use a hammer on everything? No. You need more than one tool? Yeah. Uh, you do? Yeah, there's a multi-tool. That, that does a lot of things. Corkscrew. Yeah. And scissors and there's like... And what are those? I don't know. They're pliers. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you get a hook out of a fish's mouth, and what does this tell us? Measure. Tape measure, that's right. You know, these tools are kind of like people. They all have different tasks that they do. You, yeah, this is a stud finder. Let's see. No. <laughs> you don't really want to be a stud. Studs are really dense. And what is this? Yeah, this is a wrench, a ratchet wrench. Yeah. And sometimes it goes this way, and sometimes it goes this way. Right, so they're like people. We can't use, uh, like, yeah, that's a level. I use it to hang up pictures in my office. I'm not putting up a doorway. I don't need a really big one, just one. Yeah, and that's a different kind of plier. Yeah, and you brought a tool with you, a pen. 
And all these, and you brought paper and pen too, all of these tools help us to do specific tasks. Now, which one of these tools do I use to clean the windows? No. <laughs> the stud finder? <laughs> Will that get them clean? <laughs> Maybe if I make these pads wet. Yeah. And, and which one of these do I use to mow the lawn? <laughs> no? You mean you can't use the same tool on everything. So like people, they come in variety, right? Not everybody has the same gifts, right? Not everybody has the same tools, right? And sometimes people in their jobs use tools that look very different than this, right? What are some tools that people in jobs use? My what? brother has a toolbox. Your brother has a toolbox, he, yeah. He's a tool in my head. Yeah. And a tool table. A tool table? Yeah, sometimes people need a table in order to put things on. Oh, no, we don't hammer heads. No. So there's, there's various kinds of tools that people have. I'm going to be reading some scripture about gifts that people have. And everybody has a gift. Everybody has a tool. But not everybody can do the same tasks. Not everybody's a hammer, thank goodness. Yes? Construction workers use tools like this. Construction workers use tools like this. But what if your job is something different from that? What if your job is helping people? What tool would you use for that? Like what? If your job were to help people do various things? I want to be a real people. Yeah. You might use a computer or maybe some paperwork, maybe a filing cabinet. All those things are tools. And just like people, they can be used to do good. And you know what? This, this, why do we use a hammer to hammer a nail? Why can't we just use our fingers or our... Why? Because it can hurt us. Probably. It can hurt us, maybe. What else? It could break your finger if you bit on it. Yeah, it could break your finger. And why can't we just turn the nut with our fingers? Why do we need a wrench? It would be too slippery. Too slippery, so this grabs hold. But also, it multiplies our force. Ever hear that? The, the longer the handle, the, the less force you have to do, use to do the same job? Yes? Doctors use tools too. Doctors use tools too. What might be some tools doctors use? Some of them use a stethoscope. Some of them use a microscope. I was a wee dog, my sister wrote one. Well, anyway, tools can multiply our efforts. Ever think of that? Yeah, doctors can't hear your heart with their ears. They need a stethoscope. They can't see your cells with their eyes. They need a microscope. We can't push in nails with our hands. We need tools to help us do important tasks. So everybody out here, including you, have tools. You have gifts that you can use. That will, and when you use them with God's help, you can multiply our efforts. Did you know that this church is a tool? Yeah, this church is a tool, and what, what is it a tool for? What does it do? Yeah, it's a tool for prayer, right? When all the people get together and pray for one thing, we multiply the effort of one person's prayer. What else might the church be used as a tool for? Yeah, there's a, there's a big sign out in the North Text that says we make... What do we make? I eat We make... Disciples. We make followers of Jesus. And those followers of Jesus do what? What do they do? They love. Yes, they make a difference. They make a difference for people. They multiply the force. So your tools, your gifts can be used to multiply the force of God in the community to make a difference for other people. Okay? So let's think about that this week as we thank God for the gifts that we have. Okay, I'm going to pray, and there's many different kinds of prayers, and there's many different ways to pray, and in this prayer, you can put your hands or your bodies in whatever posture, but when I pray up here, what I am expecting is that during this prayer, that your bodies and your mouths are still, okay? Can we do that while we pray? Okay? Yeah. All right, can we do that? Can you pray with me? Can you make your body and your mouth still for me, please? All right. 
Lord God, we thank you for so many gifts that you give to all of us, including children that help us to multiply the force that you give us. And so, Lord, help us to discover our gifts and help us to use them to multiply your good in the community and beyond. We ask this in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming up. See you next week. All right. Okay. Now it's our time to pray or to continue to pray. And so for that purpose, we list certain persons in your bulletin, and those are the ones that have been reported to us by the prayer requests on the inside of your bulletin. If you have a prayer request, just fill it out, drop it in the offering plate, and we will continue to pray for you. Please note that those and all of these oral prayers that you're offering are public. If you have a private prayer, please see me or George Ann. Okay, so what updates do we have of any of these people that are listed here? Yes, Nancy. Okay, Barbara Davis, Nancy Siler's sister, has multiple issues, the latest of which is hip replacement. So pray for her, yes. Yes, Jeff Saltzman's um, father, Stuart, is having heart surgery on Thursday, and so pray for all those in that family system as he goes through that. Other updates? Yes, Mike. Well, it's a traveling emergency for my parents. My, my uncle Arnie passed away this last week. Um, many of you know that I was about a year ago, my wife Connie had passed away. Um, and my parents are going up to northern Minnesota for the funeral uh, there later this week, and then they're going to be um, heading over to North Dakota for the burial this week. So prayers that everything goes well and everything just goes well. Yeah, prayers um, for Mike's family as they... Um, more than the passing of his uncle Arnie and traveling mercies for his parents to go to the services in Minnesota and North Dakota. All right. Other new concerns? Yes, Christy. Okay, so... A cousin, a 38-year-old cousin to Morgan Jackson, uh, discovered he has a brain tumor and needs surgery tomorrow, you said? And his name is Jared. Okay, others? Yeah. Okay, Gary, you said? So Gary Borman in the hospital, complications for pancreatitis. Oh, Jeff, and then... This past week, my, uh, my first cousin's 20-year-old son passed away from a heart attack. Um, that was a huge for uh, his family and his uh, father's heart and Travis died of that as well. Okay, so Jeff's first cousin, 28 years old, died of a... Such Okay, your first cousin's son died of a heart attack, 28. And yes. A little word on Sharon's condition. She had a staple pulled out of her knee that was going to be a replacement, and she'll be, I'm kind of glad to hear that she will be too. She's been with friends this entire time. She will be able to go back and get around her trailer on her own by the end of the week. Oh, good. So uh, for Sharon Meyer, who's recovering from knee replacement surgery, um, going well, and she'll be able to return to her own home and uh, care for herself. And so that's a, that's a joy. Just a second. Okay, any other concerns before we move to Joyce? I'm sorry, I'm missing one over here. Yes, we can pray for your mom. Tell me again her name. Melissa. Okay. Did you have a concern? Uh, I lifted up a friend last week who is a breast cancer survivor. She had a biopsy this week. The cancer is back. So her family and I are praying for her. They caught it early, but it's still there. So we're going to be in the Lord's hands this week. Okay.
Okay, and her name is Sarah. Sarah, a friend of Jason's uh, recurrence of breast cancer. Okay, others. Okay, any more joys? You have a joy too? Oh, no. Sometimes they, they come together, joys and concerns. Yes. That's a joy? <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Connie. I think a lot of you all know that I've celebrated the marriage of my daughter Casey in Seminole. Um, Connie and I have been married for 20 years. And we have a lot of joy. Amen, amen. All right, any others? Yes, Jen. How old are you? Fifteen-year-old. Um, it's Brandon. Um, suffers with migraines, thirty-five days in a row. Um, he's been migraine-free for several days, but they still don't have any answers. So, pray for Brandon and his family. All right. Others. Amen. Thanks to God for a good first week of school, um, which reminds me, you will be, well, I don't know how you'll be, but I was very proud that our church was able to connect with the LSS students. I blessed their backpacks on Thursday in a, in a service, and, um, you know, it was a, a, a voluntary thing. Not everybody had to come, but I think everybody did, from three years old to sixth grade or whatever it was. We filled both of these sections and half of each of those sections. And um, it was a worship service. I was able to pray with them and to read some scripture to them and teach them that Jesus is a cool dude. Um, some of you know that song. Uh, they didn't, but they left singing it. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, and every one of them wanted me to touch their backpack and bless it and, and prove to them that God is bigger than anything that they face at school. And so we're grateful that there are many good things happening at school, and um, we made a connection in a way that we wouldn't have made if we didn't have the outreach center and the daycare and the after-school programs. So um, please know that that is, is bearing fruit. That's, uh, it's a tool that we're using to make a difference in the community. Others. Okay, hearing none, I'll invite you into a time of silent personal prayer, and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer ending with, with the Lord's Prayer. Holy God, what a privilege to worship you again this morning in this space with these people. We truly celebrate our connectedness this morning. We pray that you would forgive us our sins, those things that we have done and left undone that have interfered in our relationship with you. We do want to be freed from this and so we long for salvation. It is in the body of Christ that we move from our propensity to live for ourselves, to living for the benefit of others, to use our gifts to build up this body of Christ. And so we pray that you would give us the discernment to know what gifts you have given us, the curiosity to explore how those gifts might be used in the church for the expansion of your kingdom. And Lord, you know that there is so much on earth that does not yet reflect the standards of your kingdom. So we pray for those who are trapped in Iraq and other places in the Middle East 
where all Christians are potential martyrs. We pray that you would guide the Christians of Iraq to food, water, shelter, and peace. And help us to be your servants as we seek to help all those who suffer, regardless of the names that they use to describe you and your love. We also pray for peace and understanding in Ferguson, Missouri. Lord, this place has become the latest microcosm of our nation's deep divide around race. And Lord, we pray that you guide not just the people in Ferguson or in Missouri, but that you guide the leaders all around this country as we look for ways to respect all people as people of sacred worth. Lord, where there is division, we pray for unity. We pray that you would reverse and reveal to us those things that we do that keep us from being brothers and sisters with each other and that you would reveal to us real and tangible ways to speak out and to stand firm against injustices that plague our world. We ask that you equip us to be people of light. A little closer to home, we do pray for those students and families who are beginning the process this weekend of becoming college and university students. We ask for continued guidance on those who are already starting their courses of study, including those in the elementary and secondary education. We pray specifically also for health concerns in and around our congregation, for those that are listed here, particularly for Stuart and his family. Lord, we pray that you would guide the surgeon's scalpels and, and just surround that operating room with your grace, that you continue to surround all families that have loved ones that are undergoing procedures that you might be the strength that they fall onto. We pray for Barbara and her many health concerns. We pray that her recovery from hip surgery might be swift and smooth. We pray also for Melissa and her family as she's hospitalized once again. And we pray for for guidance and wisdom and understanding for her family. Lord, we know that you heal all, and yet there is no cure for some diseases yet. And so we pray that you help us to heal what needs to be healed, to bind what needs to be bound, and loose what needs to be loosened. We pray for Brandon and his family as he, at such a young age, has to endure so much pain and so much struggle. We thank you for the gift of his life and for all that he represents to, to us and his family. We pray that you might give the specialists answers, that you might reveal to, the, to them a pathway to peace for him and his family. Pray for Gary Borman and their family as he once again is hospitalized. We pray for Jared Morgan's cousin, that answers might be found and that the surgery might be effective and the recovery swift. We pray for those families who are grieving, especially those who are grieving the sudden loss of, of young adults, such as Jeff's cousin's son. We're grateful for Sharon Meyer's recovery. We pray for Sarah and her continued um, need for healing and for strength as she faces uh, a return of cancer once again. And so, Lord, for all of this and so much more, we give you thanks and praise, and we pray in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now it's our...
privileged to respond to God's love for us by giving God's tithes and our offerings. And so as the ushers come forward, I'll ask you to prepare yourselves for that. Almighty and merciful God, as we give back these tithes and offerings this morning, we are reminded that, there, that it is here where intersects the relationship of our hearts and our connection to the material world. We pray that you would not only use these gifts, but also use us, use our hands, our feet, our voices, and our hearts to change the world for your important mission. Bless these gifts as you bless the givers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please remain standing and join us in the hymn of preparation, Many Gifts, One Spirit.
be seated. I'm going to shift gears slightly today from the Old Testament trajectory that we've been on to call your attention to the Romans passage in our Revised Common Lectionary, and this is Paul's letter to people that he hadn't met yet, people in Rome, and for 11 chapters he's been making the case that we as humans are necessarily sinful and in bondage to sin, but then about the 10th or 11th chapter, he starts turning a corner, and now in verse 12, we see that he starts making the case that we are all eligible for salvation because we are all gifted by God. So here now, these first eight verses of chapter 12 of Paul's letter to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, we are not all, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we do thank you for the many gifts that you give us. We especially thank you in this moment for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and fall upon us, move among us and through us, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Would it deepen your faith if you were to teach it? Came the rhetorical question from the organizer of Disciple One Bible Study, 
and I knew it was a rhetorical question, intended to encourage me to teach the next year there at Asbury United Methodist, where I took Disciple One in the fall of 98 and the spring of 99. And I had come to that meeting with great expectation, hoping that my fellow graduates and I would discern together what the next steps would be. And I had such a wonderful experience learning more about the Bible and myself and others in that study that I was ready to go on to a faith-deepening experience in Disciple Two. But as we talked together, it became clear that there was not enough interest for Disciple Two, for you had to be a graduate of Disciple One, and there weren't enough of those that wanted to go on. But we were committed to continuing to teach Disciple One for those who had not yet had it, if we could find a teacher. Yeah. And so that question pierced my soul as though my fellow lay member had just channeled the Holy Spirit. And so I finally said yes, because I could hear within her question the Holy Spirit really calling me to a, to a vocation of teaching. It was like a burning bush moment in which God seemed to appear and said, unless you teach them, you know, the same as God said to Moses, unless you lead them, unless you teach them, these people that I have attracted to your church will remain ignorant of my word. And so, with the help of the pastor, I began that next fall teaching the 34-week course of Disciple One. And I'm glad I did. In mid to late summer of that year, we started promoting the class and the pre-registrations for it. And one of those Sundays in which I was promoting it, there was a new family to church. A, A man in his late 30s attended that church for the first time ever because his wife wanted to touch base with her Christian heritage after the death of her mother. One of the reasons I ask in the survey about life changes in your life is that those are the times in which the Holy Spirit can speak to us. They're, they're times in which we're receptive to spiritual information, and that was the case with my now friend Mike and his wife Candy. So this man, Mike, was uninitiated in the church, unchurched, unbaptized, and in fact convinced that organized religion was a fraud. But somehow he was moved in that service by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that moved me, to take a class from me who was also moved by the Holy Spirit to do this thing outside of my comfort zone. And like I said, I've since become friends with Mike, and he gave me permission to talk to you about this today. Both he and his wife enrolled in the class, and he was there that first night when I announced, I don't know why I announced this, I want to blame it on the teaching materials, but I said, we'll be studying both types of Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, and I gave them some examples of study Bibles that they could use, and Mike, being a person of action, went right from class to Barnes & Noble where he got one of the recommended study Bibles, and then in his ignorance, asked the sales associate where he could find something called the New Testament. I don't know why I said that. Set him up. Well, he knew about as much about the Bible as I knew about one of his calculus books. And yet a few months later, after he and Candy had taken the class, I attended his baptism at Asbury. And by the time I left there in 2003, not only was he a baptized Christian, but he was the lay leader of the church, and he was the organizer of all the adult uh, Bible studies, the disciple Bible studies. We had all four of them going. He had taken all four and was organizing teachers and students into this program. And he's been doing that for a number of years. And today, he's a devoted father of two grown daughters, and he prays daily for the Holy Spirit's will. And it didn't stop there. He also now has a seminary education. And he has participated in the two-year academy for spiritual formation. And beyond that, he's, he's now our conference's current director of lay servant ministries. And he was just recently elected the national president of the National Association of Conference Directors of Lay Speaking Ministries. All of that came about because he listened to the Holy Spirit speaking to him. And I listened to the Holy Spirit speaking to me 
Despite our misgivings, we came together for that purpose. Neither one of us knew that either one of us was going to be in the position we now are, nor did we ever remotely imagine that it was possible. And yet, we were willing to take the next hesitant step, guided by God. Is either one of us perfect? No. However, the point is that each of us and each of you is gifted by the Holy Spirit to do something. None of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. Each one of us has a gift. You are gifted by the Holy Spirit. Each one of you has a gift. That means you are somebody. You are a person of sacred worth. You are gifted, and you are gifted. We all are gifted by God, the Holy Spirit, and we're given these gifts not for ourselves. And please hear me. I need to, I need to preach to myself sometimes that we don't manufacture these gifts, and so we don't use them to impress people with us, we use them to expand God's kingdom here on earth. We use them as tools to multiply our force, to expand God's kingdom and to do what God calls us to do. And this was a new concept back in the days that Paul was writing. It was a new concept for the Roman Christians that he had never met. And so for the first 11 chapters, as I said, he made the case that we are in bondage to sin and that by our very nature, we are slaves to that. But then gradually, he began to show that all of us, because we're loved by God and gifted by God, all of us can be saved. Salvation is possible for every person. Preaching professor Alice McKenzie describes this salvation as a process or a journey that we go through. She writes, our lives as disciples of Christ are a journey from seeing ourselves as individual bodies to seeing ourselves as members of the body of Christ. You see, all who believe in Jesus, regardless of whether they're members of a church, are part of that body. So even before you're confirmed, you're part of the body of Christ, and that includes our youth. So hear me, teenagers and children, when I'm speaking about gifts, I'm talking about you. You are gifted by God to use those gifts to serve others. Now, the youth leaders will remember that I talked about Jeremiah a couple weeks ago. Jeremiah was called into ministry when he was 13, and it wasn't an easy ministry. He had to go and tell the king, you're going the wrong direction. Unless you change your ways, you and all your people are going to suffer the consequences. And they said, ah, and then they suffered the consequences. And Mary, you know, was about the same age when she got the assignment of, of the world, no greater assignment was ever given to any person to be the bearer of God's child, to be the mother of Jesus. And some traditions say that Joseph, her betrothed, wasn't too much older than she. So likewise, if, it's, if you're never too young for gifts, you're never too old for gifts. Let me tell you the story of one Miss Jean Christie of Andrews, North Carolina. She called up her pastor one day and asked the pastor if there was anything that she, as an older adult, could do for the church. And he said, yeah, you know, in fact, there's some of our church members who aren't able to get out much, and they tend to get discouraged from time to time. Perhaps you could call them up periodically and just cheer them up, at least on their birthdays. Give them a call, let them know that we at the church care for them, and they're God's children, and they have gifts too. And so... She thought she could do that, and she started it the next Monday at the age of 104. Okay, 104 years old, being a volunteer and a servant of God. And after she had done that for two years, <laughs> the church wanted to have a celebration for her birthday. She had made birthdays really important for other people, and so they wanted to celebrate her birthday, and so they had this big celebration. And the United Methodist News Service got wind of this, and they wanted to come and do a story because this is so unusual. And so they asked her why she did it, and she said that ever since she was a member, from age 12 or 13, her favorite activities at church were mingling with the other church goers, and she looked forward to seeing them all as often as she could. And then, of course, they interviewed the pastor, and in the days before her celebration, while she was still 105, Pastor Mike McDonald said, if 105 is not too old to serve the church. What's your excuse? <laughs> you know, sometimes we hear that, oh, I've done my time. It's somebody else's time. 
If you're not yet 105, <laughs> you know, God's not done with you yet. There's still gifts for you to do. And so I hope that during this coming week and in the ensuing weeks that you find time to reflect on your spiritual gifts. What might they be? Now, there's, there's lots of gifts. Paul lists some in Romans, and then he lists a whole other set of gifts that are different from these in 1 Corinthians 12, and then there's the fruits of the Spirit that are listed in Galatians, and there's many different gifts. But when we share our gifts, then everyone benefits. When we share our gifts, everyone benefits. So if we are endowed by our Creator with these gifts and freed to use them in this body of Christ, what shall we do? Well, perhaps you have the gift of prophecy. Are you able to tell truth to power in a way that makes a difference for the powerless? Or maybe you have the gift of ministry, which is basically helping people in need. Perhaps you're a teacher at heart, regardless of what you do for a living. Or perhaps you have the gift of exhortation. Sometimes exhortation is described as interpretation. In the days of John Wesley in the 1700s, they used to have exhorters, I'm told, that stood outside of the church before the days of electronic amplification or outside the meeting house or whatever, and they would repeat or interpret to the people outside what was being said inside so that everybody could hear. And then they would often have two services a Sunday, one in the morning and one in the evening, and sometimes the preacher would preach in the morning and then go to the next town to do their evening service while the exhorter did the evening service. So... Exhorters are those who explain and interpret and expand what, what God's message is. So people of prophecy need people of exhortation. We can use those in this church. We need guest speakers from time to time. And we also need people who can interpret for others what our vision is, what our mission is, what our important tasks are, so that those people can understand it in their own concept, so that they can understand it in their language, so that they'll buy in and jump on board. We also need people who are gifted in generosity, whether that is of treasure, time, or talents. And perhaps this is where I should not avoid a chance to say that all of us, all of us, whether gifted with generosity or not, are instructed by God to give God a minimum of 10% of our net earnings every year. Okay, I don't make those up. <laughs> God mentions money more than any other subject in Scripture. I didn't write the Scripture. But what I'm saying here is those who are gifted with generosity are not those who are giving the minimum, <laughs> okay? Those who are gifted with generosity are those who go above and beyond the minimum. And cash is only one way in which to give monetarily. Most of you know that. Some of you have property, commodities, stocks, or other appreciated assets that maybe you don't need for cash flow. I know that some of you count on that, but others of you don't. And you might not want to pay the capital gains tax on that, and so you can simply sell those appreciated assets to the church, and everybody wins. You avoid the tax implication, and we get the benefit. But some people don't have cash or those appreciated assets, and so they might also be gifted with generosity of of time or talent. We certainly need the generosity of those resources. In most churches, there are people who are actually looking for opportunities to match their deep gladness with the church's needs, as Frederick Buechner writes. And I suspect that's the case here, too. I just don't know you all well enough to know what your gifts are to match them up to what the church's needs are. So I'm hoping that some of you will come out of the woodwork and let George Ann and I know some people are gifted with leadership. There are many styles and characteristics of leadership, but I found surprisingly few definitions of what leadership is that doesn't already assume that you're leading people or managing change. For instance, a leadership summit I attended recently here in Sioux Falls uh, through a telecast out of Chicago featured uh, Carly Fiorina, the former CEO of Hewlett Packard. She said, as a, a leader is one who changes conditions and the order of things. That's an okay working definition, but then I got to thinking, well, in that case, most criminals are leaders, <laughs> right? Because they want to change the conditions under which they'll follow the law, and because 
by disobeying the socially enacted and enforced law, they change the order of society's relationship to the individual. Usually, the society takes precedent, but when you are above the law, you think the individual takes precedent. So they're changing the order of things. So maybe that's not an entirely true definition. So one of my heroes, Colin Powell, General Colin Powell says that leadership is the art of routinely accomplishing more than the science of management says is possible. A force multiplier. Okay, that's a, that's a better definition, but it depends on the extraordinary efforts of those who are following you. If they're not following you, if they're not motivated, then you really can't accomplish these extraordinary efforts. So a leader really needs to be able to motivate and direct and to organize those efforts toward a common purpose. So probably one of my favorite current definitions of leadership comes from the book Influencer, written by Joseph Grenny and his colleagues at, um, I forget the name of their, uh, Vital Smarts, I think is the name of their corporation. They um, are corporate coaches. Anyway, the authors there define leadership as the capacity to influence others to change their behavior in order to accomplish important results capacity to influence others to change their behavior in order to accomplish important results. And under that definition, every good parent and every teacher is a leader. The church needs leaders. We need people that influence others, as Alice McKenzie says, from seeing ourselves as independent bodies to really working together to be the body of Christ. And the important results that we want to achieve are the same that I keep preaching every Sunday, that I talk to the children about, that are written on the wall. The important activities are to make disciples and what? Make a difference. Our mission is to make disciples, to make a difference. What's our mission again? To make disciples, to make a difference. Amen. Don't forget that. We're going to be guided by our mission. That's what we do. And lastly... Many are gifted with compassion. One good definition of compassion is a deep desire to alleviate the suffering of others. Experts say it's a form of love that fuels acts of ministry. Now, not all of these gifts are found in isolation of each other. Many of them come coupled together, and many of you have multiple gifts, but the church can use those gifts. And so in the coming weeks, we'll be seeking volunteers to assist in in accomplishing the church's mission and in the administrative apparatus of the church. And so we're seeking a variety of people with a diverse set of gifts in order to accomplish our important task of making disciples and making a difference. So if you have gifts, of course you all have gifts, but if they're not being tapped, please see Georgian or I. And if you're curious about what gifts you might have, we can connect you with several spiritual gifts inventories. But we're all gifted, and we're gifted by God with spiritual gifts in order to use them for the benefit of others, not just for our own benefit. So let us go forth prayerfully, discerning our spiritual gifts, and then offer them as holy and acceptable to God as an act of spiritual worship. Amen.
We share each other's woes. Our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we are sundered apart, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still. It's one of my favorite hymns. It formed me when I was a child. It describes what I believe is the body of Christ, especially those last two verses that we care for each other. That's one of the reasons that I like the idea that you pray for each other, that you care for each other. And then, of course, even when we depart from this life, we are, we are not lost because they are with God and God is with us, and they are not far from us. And so because we're all one community of God, that's one of the reasons that I say when you leave, please don't leave anyone a stranger. I won't embarrass them, but that there are three former parishioners of mine in the congregation today from Brookings, Leroy Ruth and Sonia Anderson. I hope you'll make them welcome, and if there's a face that you don't recognize, please extend a hand and welcome them in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Of course, there's fellowship in the Narthex, but if you're interested in the sit-down, you can go through two sets of double doors to our multi-purpose outreach center gym. <laughs> and of course, the meeting for those interested in the Costa Rica trip will take place right after the service as well. So with that in mind, go with this benediction, knowing that you are gifted, every one of you. You are endowed by your Creator with inalienable spiritual gifts. And may you be encouraged and may your examination of those gifts lead to a sharing of the gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. In the name of God the giver, God the Savior, and God the encourager. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's sermon from Southern Hills United Methodist Church. To learn more about Southern Hills, please visit us on our website at www.sohillsumc.org. That's www.sohillsumc.org. Have a great week.